of the hour, and we come on the air tonight with negotiators in a race against time to prevent what could be the end of a very fragile ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas. How things are looking tonight as we see more hostages released just in the past hour. We are live in the region. Then Congressman George Santos says he will not stand by as he watches his colleagues and his words rush a process to kick him out of office. How that vote that's happening tomorrow could shape up. Plus, an influential Hollywood social activist now dead, allegedly at the hands of a woman prosecutors say was stalking one of his friends. How the community in L.A. there is mourning the loss. And an NBC News investigation finding carbon monoxide poisoning was behind a string of deaths as Airbnbs are struggling with this just in the last decade. How the families of those who died are pushing for stricter safety regulations to make sure others don't have to experience that same loss. And what the company is saying tonight, that's in our original. Plus, how the man known here in D.C. as the voice of D.C. managed to beat a life-changing and challenging diagnosis that could have ended his career and his life. That's coming up later in the show. Good day, I'm Tom Costello. I'm in for Hallie, who is on assignment. And right now, the incredibly fragile ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas to pause fighting inside Gaza and let more hostages out, it looks like it may be ending. As we're waiting to see more newly freed hostages arrive in Israel. We'll have more on that in just a moment. But just 24 hours ago, that uneasy deal was extended at the last minute for just a single day. Okay, fast forward to now, where it's midnight in the region and negotiators are racing against time to keep the truce going. Well, lots of questions on whether that could actually happen tonight, there, local time. As we're just learning, six Israelis were released in the last hour. Now, back in Israel. And look at this, another two freed from Hamas captivity earlier. You can see them there getting into a Red Cross van right there in Gaza in this exclusive video from Al Jazeera. And here, one of them, 21-year-old Mia Shem, in an emotional reunion with her mother and brother in Israel. Two more hostages are expected to be freed any minute. 30 Palestinians were also released today, according to Egypt. As we're learning of new violence in the region, Israel says at least Three people were killed, 13 others wounded in a shooting at a bus stop in Jerusalem. Hamas is claiming responsibility for that attack. We've got our team on the ground on this one. David Noriega is in the region in Tel Aviv. Ali Rafa is covering this angle from the White House. David, can we start with you? Because we saw the same situation 24 hours ago and the truce got pushed for another day. What do we know about whether this could happen again, local time this evening, any minute? Tom, we know that there is an ongoing and intense diplomatic effort to get this truce extended once again, just for a little bit of context. Before the ceasefire started on Friday, the Israeli cabinet approved a framework for an agreement that would allow for four initial days of ceasefire that could then be extended day by day, as long as Hamas was willing to release 10 hostages for each of those days, and Israel was willing to release 30 Palestinian prisoners. That was an agreement to release women and children hostages for women and children prisoners. We're still within that 10 days. We're in day seven. As long as we're within that 10 days, it's reasonably likely that the ceasefire could be extended. That's what's happened multiple times now since that original four-day period ended. It's what happened, as you said, several hours after midnight local time last night. However, there is no guarantee that it will actually happen. It is extremely delicate, extremely fluid. It has to basically be renegotiated anew every single day. That's why we can't jump to any conclusions until we actually receive confirmation that the truce will continue tomorrow. Tom? Yeah, this is evolving minute by minute. What more do we know about the hostages released today and those still left inside Gaza, right? Mostly men who Hamas is not letting out. Right. So the hostages were released tonight in a slightly different way than what we've seen. We saw a group of two hostages released earlier in the evening and then just now a group of six hostages that we can now confirm are in Israeli territory. E even though the deal uh, involves 10 hostages per day, we're only seeing eight today because uh, the, the people negotiating this are counting two hostages that were released yesterday, initially supposedly outside of the framework of the agreement, but because they were Israeli citizens and they were women, they are now actually counting towards that agreement. Agreement. Um, as far as the hostages still in Gaza, Tom, as you said, we're getting to the point where 
it is mostly men. And the people, the women and children that were agreed upon within the framework of this agreement are running out. That means something really, really hugely important, which is that if the ceasefire is going to extend beyond the framework of this agreement, it's essentially going to have to be renegotiated according to terms that we still don't entirely know. And there's going to be a lot of different political pressure that the Israeli government is under from different directions to either not engage in those negotiations at all or to engage in them in some specific way that different people want who are looking for different kinds of outcomes. Tom? Okay, David. David Noriega is staying on the story for us from Tel Aviv. We'll check back. Thank you, David. Let's bring in Ali Rafa, posted for us near the White House. Ali, there's this diplomatic race against time right now to keep the truce going. And Secretary of State Blinken, he met with top Israeli and Palestinian leaders today. What more can you tell us about that activity? Yeah, Secretary of State Antony Blinken making his third trip to the Middle East since this war began. He met with Prime Minister Netanyahu and his war cabinet, as well as the Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas during this trip, something that President Biden wasn't able to do when he visited this region a couple weeks ago. And Blinken spoke about what he talked uh, to these Israeli officials about. First of all, he talked uh, about the need to protect more innocent civilian life in Gaza. He said said that before Israel resumes its military operations, uh, whenever this ceasefire does end, something that Prime Minister Netanyahu has insisted will happen, uh, that the U.S. wants to see plans put in place uh, to prevent uh, more innocent uh, civilian deaths, for Israel to be more surgical and precise in its attacks on Gaza. He also said uh, that the loss of life that the world saw play out in the first few weeks of this war cannot repeat itself in the south of Gaza once these military operations resume because Israel has told so many Palestinians uh, from the north to head south. Uh, Blinken saying that he wants that to be officially designated a safe space for Palestinians uh, to seek refuge from this conflict. Uh, he also said uh, he stressed to Netanyahu that with the harsh winter months starting in Gaza, he wants uh, assurance that humanitarian aid will continue to be allowed to flow there to, uh, to Palestinians. And lastly, Tom, he also talked about plans to prevent uh, this conflict from spreading wider, as well as plans for what comes next whenever this conflict does end. Blinken saying that he spoke with both Netanyahu and Abbas uh, about the U.S.'s desire to have peace and stability in this region, uh, talking to them about what factors that would entail to be able to achieve that. Uh, Ali, talk about now more about these two American hostages who have been freed and another eight are believed to still be in captivity as some of their family members are now expressing, I understand, frustration with the Red Cross, right? That's right. These uh, family members of American hostages being held in Gaza, they met with reporters yesterday, and they also met with representatives from the Red Cross, and they expressed some deep frustrations uh, with the Red Cross for uh, not being able to provide more uh, public updates as to the conditions and the status of their loved ones, saying uh, that they want more updates. They pressured uh, international organizations uh, to be able to allow the Red Cross to be able to do that. And this is something that Secretary of State Antony Blinken also addressed during his pressure, presser in Tel Aviv earlier. Listen. Clearly, it would be very beneficial and important for the Red Cross to have access uh, to hostages, to be able to um, uh, check on their well-being uh, and, uh, and condition. Uh, having said that, of course, none of that should be necessary because there shouldn't be any hostages in the first place. Those families uh, pushing for uh, more awareness by the Red Cross as to the treatment of these hostages, uh, as to their medical well-being, saying that some of them are in need of medical care. The families of those hostages were set to uh, speak with and meet with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan at some point today. Uh, we've reached out to the White House for an update on that and uh, are, are awaiting that, Tom. Ali, thank you. Ali Rafa at the White House. All right, still here in Washington. Just before we came on the air, we heard from the first of the Republican House leadership, Representative Steve Scalise, saying he will vote against kicking the controversial Congressman George Santos out of office in tomorrow's vote. That's after Santos got rather heated on the House floor earlier today, saying he will not go quickly. Listen to this. On what basis does this body feel that precedent must be changed for me? I'm curious to know, what is the schedule of the Ethics Committee? 
Why rush this? To deliver a predetermined outcome sought out by some members? Santos so it says he's not going quietly. And remember, this is the guy who the House Ethics Committee found spent thousands of dollars worth of campaign money on high-end shopping items, on Botox, on adult website only fans. He's also facing a 23-count federal indictment that accuses him of stealing the identities of campaign donors. Santos has pleaded not guilty to those charges. He says he hasn't done anything wrong. NBC's Ryan Nobles is on Capitol Hill in the middle of all of this. Uh, Ryan, Santos's fellow lawmakers also got a chance to debate the expulsion vote. Some in support of him, some against, some want to see him gone. Very outspokenly, though, against all of this. Can you talk us through how this goes down tomorrow and what's the likelihood that this is his last day in Congress? Well, keep in mind, Tom, this is the third time that the House of Representatives has attempted to expel George Santos from office. And uh, while it does seem to be momentum behind the idea that it's time for him to go, it is certainly not a guarantee. And that's because it requires a two-thirds vote of the entire House. That means 290 members need uh, to vote to expel him. And if you break that down, if every single Democrat votes to expel him, it would still need another 77 Republicans to do so. But to be clear, there are a number of Republicans who believe that it's time. Listen to what they had to say on the floor today. If we do not take the Ethics Committee and their results seriously, then why even have the committee in the first place? These are the exhibits that they attach to the investigative report. The 50-plus page report goes into great detail, and it paints a picture of the fraud committed by Santos. And while there were quite a few Republicans that stood up on the House floor, including the chair of the House Ethics Committee, who you just heard from, saying that it's time for Santos to go, he does have his defenders. You rightly point out that the House Majority Leader, Steve Scalise, saying that he's not in voting in favor of this expulsion resolution tomorrow. And the House Speaker himself, Mike Johnson, has said that he is concerned about the precedent that it may set. Uh, so while, as I said before, Tom, there is momentum here, we're going to have to wait yeah. and see how this vote plays before we decide on George Santos's future. How, how much of some Republicans who are opposed, how much of that is because they have such a razor thin majority in the House, they don't want to take any chances of losing that. And the second thing is, I was watching Santos today, and he brought forth his own expulsion resolution against another member of Congress, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, and it, kind of a way to demonstrate what he believes is this dangerous precedent. He brought up a expulsion resolution uh, toward uh, the Democratic member Jamal Bowman for pulling the fire alarm during that debate and subsequent vote over the uh, effort to prevent the government shutdown from a couple of months ago. Now, Jamal Bowman has pled guilty to a misdemeanor in this and has paid a $1,000 fine and apologized for it. Santos's argument is that he... Uh, hasn't been convicted of anything, and here you have a situation where a member has actually pled guilty to something. Now, it's not going to be an argument that I think too many members of Congress are, are going to buy, uh, but when you talk about the precedent of all of this, uh, Tom, you know, in the past, uh, this has only happened five other times. Three of the times that members of Congress were expelled, it was because they fought for the Confederacy during the Civil War. The other two times, these members were indeed both convicted. So this would be uncharted territory uh, for the Congress, but the members in favor of this resolution believe that the punishment fits the crime and it's time for George Santos to go. And we'll watch it play out live tomorrow. All right, and thank you very much. Uh, right there in the thick of all of it. A big day on Wall Street today with the Dow Jones Industrial Average jumping 500 points, sending the index to a new high for the year and capping a very strong November rally, 8% in November, on the back of a key inflation marker from the Fed and some strong tech earnings driving this huge market rally. Investors are now betting big that the Fed will cut interest rates several times next year. And this comes as we've got new numbers out today showing mortgage rates dropping. Now, all things are relative, but dropping to the lowest level since September, down to 7.22%. And while rates dropped over the past few months, the average rate on a 30-year loan is still much higher than it was two years ago when rates were around 3%. Remember those good old days? 
We also learned today that pending home sales, which really measures signs that contracts on existing homes have already been uh, signed and dealt with, that they have fallen to their lowest level since they started tracking these back in 2001. We want to bring in Caleb Silver, the editor-in-chief of Investopedia. Caleb, we got a key piece of inflation data today about how inflation is already playing out, maybe starting to cool, and that really is what the market liked, right? So is Jerome Powell, the Fed chairman, is his plan working to, buy, to cool the economy by hiking interest rates, and might we avoid a recession? Yeah, so far, so good. And the Fed did pause interest rate hikes the last time, the last two times it met, and will probably pause again when it meets again in the middle of December because inflation has stopped accelerating. In fact, it was flat month over month. You talk about a 3.5% annual rate of inflation. Tom, you remember when it was 9% in July of 2022. So it has come down slowly but surely. And the fact that gas prices are down meaningfully as well means more people have more money to spend. So all of that is also releasing the pressure on the 10-year yield uh, for the Treasury bonds, which really drive the stock market. That's why the stock yeah. market's been rallying in November. Yields on the 10-year have fallen. Stocks have been rising. Yeah, and let's keep in mind that the rate of inflation, I mean, inflation itself is still going up. But it's just the rate of that, of that increase is slowing. Let's talk right now about housing, though. People are used to these really low, low, low rates, right? I mean, 4%, 3%, but that's not realistic historically. I mean, the first house I bought, I think I paid 10% on, and now we're at what, seven and a quarter percent? How much lower do you think these rates could go? Will we ever get back down to what we saw a couple of years ago? Yeah, I talked to our parents' generation, and they were paying 12 13%. So we've had it good yeah. for a very long time. Half of homeowners have mortgage rates that are under 5%. So people are not incentivized to sell right now. And for first-time homebuyers, very hard to buy when mortgage rates are this high. And home prices are so high, too, because of tight supply. Mortgage rates are going to continue to tick lower. Why? Because of what you said at the top. The Fed will probably start cutting rates next year. And the 30-year mortgage is very sensitive to the Fed funds rate. So as the Fed cuts rates or intuits that it will cut rates over time, you're going to see mortgage rates drop very quickly. They're not going to go back down to 5% or 4%. They're going to be in this 6 to 7% range, and I think that's going to get more people into the housing market. Well, that's real money. And then, of course, if you buy, if you buy high and the, and the rate is high, you can always, uh, you know, refi down. As I just talked to somebody outside the uh, studio here about a, a minute ago. Caleb, thank you. Caleb Silver, uh, always on top of all the financials. Some of the countries that pump a lot of the world's oil, many of them, OPEC members, are deciding to cut production at a time when there seems to be a lot of supply. Why? Well, global economic growth is slowing, in part because of the wars in the Middle East and Ukraine and the U.S is pumping record amounts of oil. Surprise, the U.S. is now the world's biggest oil producer. Oil is priced globally, not locally. Oil producing countries are struggling to keep prices up. West Texas crude, a key measurement, is now selling at about $75 a barrel. That's down from $123 a barrel 18 months ago when the war in Ukraine was really raging. CNBC's Brian Sullivan joins me now. All right, I like to geek out on this stuff because I find it fascinating. But these lower oil prices are good news at the pump. Drivers are paying 35 cents less a gallon more or more less than a year ago. And there's even talk of cutting production today, but prices didn't go down. Why is that? Or pardon because me, prices they, didn't go up. T Why is Tom, that? I, Tom, I'm happy to geek out with you all day on this, my friend, because this is truly a global battle, the battle for the pump the battle for what we pay for oil, yeah. and a little bit of political power as well. Okay, here's why. So without going in the weeds, you got OPEC. Everybody knows what OPEC is, 13 nations led by Saudi Arabia. They've got what they call OPEC Plus, which is another 10 nations, well, 11 after today. We'll get to that in just a second. And they meet every so often. They said, okay, we're going to set these quotas. We don't want you to produce more than this because they're trying to limit the amount of oil that's on the market. Why? Of course, they don't want prices to spike, but they want prices to remain just elevated enough where everybody, all their members, are making enough money without killing demand. Demand. But to your point, here's the problem. The United States, we are the number one oil producer in the world by far. According to the EIA, 13.2 million barrels a day. Who'd have thunk it a couple years yeah. ago that we'd be at record highs? And the market, Tom, just doesn't believe that OPEC is going to keep these cuts because they are 
voluntary after all. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and you combine the United States and Canada, North America's oil production, it's just astonishing. I have been struck, Brian, that OPEC doesn't have the punch or the influence it once did. It used to be if OPEC, you know, cut production, then your local gas pump prices are going up. Now Brazil is joining OPEC+. Plus. I mean, will OPEC ever have the punch it used to have if the United States and Canada combined are, are such giants on the market? Well, I think so. And, uh, you know, listen, right now, and maybe they just put on, uh, you know, like a bigger boxing glove or something like that because they added Brazil. And, and this is wild. And we don't think about Brazil. We talk about Brazil. Is, but is Brazil about, going like, along with it? Yeah. yeah, Pele and Formula One. And we don't think about oil. Brazil has quietly become one of the biggest oil producers in the world from 2.9 million barrels a day to 3.5 million barrels a day, probably getting close to going to 4 million barrels a day. Today, OPEC said, Brazil, you're not a member of OPEC, but they're a member of that confederation we called OPEC+. Plus. So after Brazil joins, Tom, OPEC+, Plus will control about 42 to 43 percent of global oil. Again, not as much as they did, and that's because the United States and Canada to your point, are yeah. just churning out all the oil we can. It's really been a, a fossil fuel revolution the last couple of years. Hard to believe. Yeah, and we haven't even gotten into the whole discussion about whether or, or the impact on the environment and the green movement and all of that, but that's for another day. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. Brian, thank you very much. you got to go to Vienna again. Another OPEC meeting is calling you. Brian Sullivan. Tonight, millions of people are under threat of severe weather in Texas as the South gets totally slammed right now. Southeast Texas and Louisiana are getting the brunt of the storm's wrath with large hail seen in the Houston area, along with some super strong winds and heavy rain there. Six inches could fall by tomorrow. The Gulf Coast facing the biggest threats of floods. And take a look at Hawaii. Flood waters are hitting the islands hard during a major rain story there with overflowing cesspools, sewers, manholes, leaving folks exposed to dead animals, chemicals, even fecal matter floating around. The state issued a public brown water advisory telling people to stay off the streets. It all comes as the UN World Meteorologist Organization says 2023 set to be the warmest year ever and we are definitely not headed in the right direction. We bring in now meteorologist Bill Karens. Bill, it seems like we're talking about something similar every week. You know, the latest indicator that the, the global warming is here and it's real. Yep. Yesterday, by the way, we had snow in the Great Lakes. Today, it's tornadoes and ugly weather in the south and those brown water warnings in Hawaii. It's been a bad weather week. Yeah, and it's probably going to get worse this weekend. I mean, the Pacific Northwest is going to get into the mix, and then the East Coast is going to have a couple storms in a row, too. So let's first start with that severe weather threat. We were concerned going into today for isolated tornadoes. Happy to report we haven't had any reported tornadoes. All the bright reds throw you where the thunderstorms are. We've had some heavy rain in areas from Texarkana heading up towards Little Rock. But it's in the Houston area that we've been most concerned with. These storms could spin a little bit and put down a tornado. So Houston, it looks like you're at the tail end of this. Things will be slowly improving. Driving out on I-10 here from Beaumont to Lake Charles, definitely some thunderstorms heading your way. See a couple of lightning strikes here. But again, we'll have to watch any of these little storms for the possibility of them starting to spin in any tornado warnings. But so far, so good. No reports of any damage or anything like that. So this storm is on the move into your Friday. It's going to fall apart a little bit. We start off with a really rainy, ugly morning, Chicago, Indianapolis to Detroit. Then by 6 p.m., that rain is over New York City, up the Hudson Valley, Syracuse, Albany to Buffalo, just some showers in the Carolinas. Then on Saturday, our attention goes back in the south. Not so much severe weather, but it's going to pour. We're going to get a lot of heavy rain during the day Saturday. The Panhandle heading towards Jacksonville, Florida, and maybe possibly Orlando, the Lake Mary area, later the day on Saturday. And then also, we talked about Hawaii. This is what we call a Kona low. So it's when we get a stalled storm system just to the east of the Hawaiian Islands. That southerly flow brings up tropical moisture. And we have gotten nailed on the big island here. Just to the southeast of Hilo, we've had reports of 12 to 18 inches of rain in, in one day. That's a ton of rain, and of course you got the volcano summits here, and the water just runs down, and it, this is a lot of farmland in here. So, Tom, one of the reasons that they have this brown water advisory is because, you know, all that water is going through the farmer's fields, and then you get the pesticides and the animal. You get it. Yeah, they're yeah. saying stay out of the water for a couple of days. Yeah, uh, I've got some coffee from Kona that is right there. Listen, real quickly, we are out of hurricane season, but we are still That's in right. tornado season, right? 
Yeah, today is the last day of hurricane season. It doesn't mean we can't get one outside of the season, but we had two landfalling storms uh, that hit the U.S., and uh, nothing is heading anywhere so we can put to rest this hurricane season. Yeah. And as we head through the weekend, you know, we're not talking about you know tornadoes or hurricanes. More or less, winter will be returning, Tom. That'll be the story. Big storms heading for the northwest. All right, we're watching it, Bill. Thank you very much. Uh, in Los Angeles tonight, a woman is facing murder charges for allegedly shooting and killing an influential Hollywood social activist. The DA's office says the woman targeted at activist Michael Latt for being friends with a woman that she, the suspect, was stalking. On Monday, she allegedly forced herself into Latt's house and shot him. He died at a nearby hospital. Ladd is the founder of a social impact marketing agency called Lead with Love, which works to support influential women and artists of color. That according to the website. Several notable people have been commenting on an Instagram post announcing his death, like filmmaker Scott Budnick, who said Latt brought hope and love to everybody. And Grey's Anatomy star Jesse Williams, he called him a shining beacon. Coming up from us, a new report from Meta highlighting how hard it is to hard, how hard it is to fight fake accounts on Facebook. What it says about one country's push to influence us, all Americans. Plus, why lottery losers in Iowa actually ended up winning? Yeah, it's true. Stay with us. Bottom of the hour, and NBC News has found that Airbnb still does not require carbon monoxide detectors to be installed at its properties, despite more than a dozen deaths in the last decade or so. More on that NBC News investigation coming up in a few minutes. But first from us, a new report from Facebook parent company Meta says it has taken down nearly 5,000 fake accounts from China as that country becomes one of the most aggressive actors trying to sway U.S. public opinion on social media. The accounts on Facebook were aimed at Americans criticizing both sides of America's political spectrum. That means the intention really is not to try to push to one opinion or another, but rather to capitalize on and further divide, really, the chasm between political parties and Americans. The information comes from Meta's third quarter integrity report. It says the company took down five distinct Chinese networks targeting foreign audiences just this year, which is more than any other country. And that brings up some real concerns as we head now into the 2024 election. We bring in now NBC's cybersecurity reporter, Kevin Collier. Kevin, uh, this seems like a lot of accounts, but it also tells us probably there, there are more out there, right? It sounds like China is not backing off of, of its efforts to influence U.S. public opinion. They're not backing off. I mean, the good news, if you want to call it that way, is uh, they really don't get that much traction. They're not that good at engaging with real users. The bad news is they are not letting up. It is a, it is a constant force. There's every evidence that it's going to keep being more and more uh, of these campaigns being created as, as uh, we get closer to an election. So do these foreign efforts to influence U.S. public opinion, do they, do they work? Do they pay off? Um, it, that's one question I have. Are we already so set in our beliefs that we're not swayed easily by, by the stuff we see on Facebook? And why is it so hard to find and bring down these accounts? Well, in, in one... As Ken Delaney and I uh, reported exclusively recently, one of the major reasons why it's so hard for these platforms to find these accounts is the U.S. government is no longer tipping any of the platforms, Facebook, Google, Twitter, et cetera, um, about the, the information the U.S. intelligence community finds about foreign intelligence propaganda mm -hmm. efforts. There has been a Republican attorneys general lawsuit. They consider it a censorship issue. Uh, but a response of that has been that while that lawsuit plays out, the FBI no longer briefs any of these companies about them. They have to find these campaigns on their own. And how aggressively are they pursuing that? I mean, Microsoft in the past was pretty aggressive, I know, about going after and looking for foreign influence, but how aggressively are these various companies, Microsoft, Meta, others, in, in looking for it? It varies. Meta loves to tout the, the accounts that they find and they've taken down, they tell us about them. Twitter appears to not be doing it at all. Uh, and we also just don't know what we don't know. We know when we learn about these accounts, but we don't know, you know, no one has a complete picture of all of these, uh, what was happening on all these platforms.
Yeah, interesting, especially in light of uh, the comments yesterday from um, Elon Musk about, uh, about Twitter X. Uh, Kevin, thank you very much. Kevin Collier. Uh, we want to get you over now to the five things our team thinks you might want to know about tonight. Number one, a New York appeals court has reinstated that gag order against former President Donald Trump. It was put on hold for a couple of weeks while Trump tried to appeal it. The order bans Trump, who's repeatedly targeted the New York judge's law clerk from making public statements about the judge's staff. Number two, a district judge is rejecting a bid by Texas. The state wanted to stop Customs and Border Protection from destroying the razor wire fencing that Texas put up along its border with Mexico. The state's attorney general says he now will appeal that decision. Number three, Senator Rand Paul performed the Heimlich maneuver on Senator Joni Ernst today after she choked on some food during a Republican conference lunch. Ernst comment on, commented on the incident, turning it into a, a political attack. She tweeted, can't help but choke on the woke policies Dems are forcing down our throats. Thanks, Dr. Rand Paul. It never ends, apparently. Number four, the Iowa Lottery posted the wrong Powerball numbers for about seven hours on its website, blaming, quote, human reporting error. But luckily, if you cashed in a winning ticket during that time, you get to keep the money. Prices ranged from four to 200 bucks. And I ask, is it a coincidence that Hallie is off today? Just asking, I don't know. Number five, astronomer, astronomers have found a rare solar system with six planets. It's 100 light years away. It's not a quick weekend trip. Unfortunately, researchers say there's little to no chance that there's any life on these planets. But the discovery can help explain how solar systems across the Milky Way have formed. And experts think there are, listen to this, trillions of planets out there beyond Earth. Brilliance. All right, now we want to bring you today's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been trying to keep an eye on. Tonight, that's the risk of carbon monoxide poisoning. The invisible gas is order orderless and it can kill. Detectors can be the only warning. A new NBC News investigation has found at least 19 people have died from suspected carbon monoxide poisoning at Airbnbs in the last decade. And now the families of those tragedies are speaking out and fighting back pushing for the company to require carbon monoxide alarms in every one of their listings. So, Hallie Jackson has that story. When Sebastian Mejia won a prestigious Fulbright scholarship and moved to Brazil last year, his mom, Rosa, couldn't have felt more proud. He was the kind of person that really did everything that he wanted to do. He set his goals and worked towards it. But just a few months later, Sebastian's family got a message from the host of the Airbnb where he'd been staying. The 24-year-old was dead. All I can describe is like a bomb dropped on me. I felt every single possible feeling. I was in shock. I literally, when I learned what happened with Sebastian, I stopped breathing. My heart died with him. The killer? Carbon monoxide poisoning. Initially, it's just where, I mean, shock grief, sadness, crying. Now it's more it starts to like anger. Carbon monoxide gas has no smell, no color, no taste, sometimes called the invisible killer. It's made when fuel is burned in things like water heaters, gas stoves, and cars. Its symptoms mimic the flu, and in high concentrations, it can be deadly, which is why detectors are critical. According to a technical report from Rio de Janeiro police, Sebastian's Airbnb had four times the maximum acceptable carbon monoxide levels and no detector in the bathroom where Sebastian and died, the report says, a broken water heater and improper ventilation. My son didn't have to die. An investigation by NBC News has identified 19 deaths since 2013 at Airbnb properties involving alleged carbon monoxide poisoning. All of those deaths happened outside the U.S. While nearly every American state requires detectors in some residential buildings, international guidelines recommend a detector on every floor, but regulations differ by country. After a death in Taiwan in 2014, Airbnb said in a blog post it would require hosts to install carbon monoxide detectors by the end of the year. Nearly a decade later, still no requirement. That blog post now deleted. When people rent those spaces, they expect, again, a minimum level of safety and protection. And without a carbon monoxide alarm, we can't be sure that we're going to wake up the next day. 
Airbnb says safety is a top priority, describing incidents as exceptionally rare. For hosts, the company encourages the installation of detectors and offers a free one. So far, giving out detectors to nearly a quarter million hosts. That amounts to fewer than 6% of all hosts worldwide. One 2018 study found less than 60% of U.S.-based Airbnb hosts said they had carbon monoxide detectors installed. For renters, Airbnb provides a search filter to find only homes with detectors. At least six lawsuits have been filed against the company concerning carbon monoxide poisoning, including one by Sebastian's family. Three are ongoing, one was dismissed, and two were settled for undisclosed amounts. Now, Sebastian's family says they're pushing for Airbnb to require all properties have carbon monoxide detectors. We don't care about any settlement that Airbnb is trying to reach with us. We want people to know about this issue so that it's changed. Not amount of money will ever compensate the life and the future that my son had. Never. Rosa working to honor her son's legacy by fighting for change. Hallie Jackson, NBC News. You might consider taking a CO detector with you when you stay at an Airbnb, wherever you go. When we come back, a mysterious explosion has killed at least one person and flattened a home near Minneapolis. What we know about that investigation. Plus, a U.S. state is now reporting a big uptick in the number of kids with pneumonia. We're talking to a doctor about who is at risk when we come back. We're back, and a county in Ohio is the first in the country to report a cluster of pneumonia cases in kids. The medical director for Warren County tells NBC News there had been 145 cases reported since August just there, and that meets the state's definition of an outbreak. It comes as hospitals in China and Denmark have been reporting surging cases of pediatric pneumonia, the county's medical Director says there is no connection with China or Denmark. Dr. Kavita Patel is one of our favorites. She's here to help us understand all of this. A lot of experts think that the COVID lockdown, what could have suppressed the immunity for kids of, the, of what they're exposed to naturally, and therefore they're more susceptible to pneumonia? Yeah, that's, that's the running theory. But in general, this is similar to what we did see in the United States. What we're seeing in China happened about a year ago in the United States with the triple-demic. So the idea is that China has had this immunity debt or people mm -hmm. that have not been exposed. And they've and, been locked down more and recently. Been, and more recently, their lockdowns were kind of released more recently. But then in, in terms of what's unfolding, and it won't just be Ohio, I, I'm mm. sure that we will see this pattern cropping up. It is, again, kind of these seasonal viruses. And they made it clear in the public health department that they're trying to figure out the sources, mm. but they're not concerned that it's something of a novel COVID virus or something to be concerned about. But it is heightened awareness for parents everywhere, including no matter where you are outside of Ohio, that if you've got sniffles, something, get it checked out. Okay, so uh, next question is, what should you be watching for? Now, right. as a kid, I had, uh, when I was a teenager, I think, I had walking pneumonia. Yeah. And if my next door neighbor wasn't the family doctor, he said he would have put me in the ER, but instead he came over and checked on me. Right. So what should parents be watching for? How do you know that it's something more serious than just, you know, the sniffles? Yeah, so something that always went in doubt, just get it checked out. But when it's more serious, the clinical signs that make it more serious, fevers, chills, things that might start out as nasal congestion, but seem to get deeper and deeper into not just a cough, but children telling you they've got pain, pain mm -hmm. in their chest when they breathe. Those are warning signs. And then, of course, if someone's having difficulty breathing, always kind of make that an urgent case. And get it checked out because doctors and pediatricians can test for the four kind of common viruses, flu A, flu B, RSV, and COVID. Those are the kind of magic four that we're seeing a yeah, lot. And some of them are teaming up. I remember yeah. being exhausted. I mean, literally sleeping Fatigue. 20 hours right. a day right. and uh, just could not get picked up out of bed. Yeah, that's another great sign. GI distress with RSV, we can see kind of problems with your appetite, problems digesting. So that can be another clue. But anytime you, you know, parents know best. Yeah. When you see somebody and when you see your child in distress, don't wait to get it checked out because remember, we've got treatments for COVID in mm -hmm. some cases. We have an RSV vaccine now. If you don't have RSV, all things to think about. What you said is so critical. We always, we as parents sometimes doubt ourselves. No, right. we know no, our kids best. We do. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, Dr. <laughs> Patel, thank you very much. You. Good info as always. All right, you know NBC covers hundreds of stories each day, and it's tough to read, watch, or listen to everything, so our bureau teams have done it for you and for me. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions, and we call the segment The Local. From our Midwest Bureau, a house in Minnesota, look at that, exploded and burned, killing at least one person, according to fire investigators, and they're looking into why it happened and whether anyone else was inside. Out of our Western Bureau, take a look at this underwater footage. This is that Navy plane that we told you about that overshot a runway in Hawaii and landed in the bay. It's now sitting on top of a coral reef. The Navy is investigating and trying to find a way to get the plane out of the water. From our D.C. Bureau tonight, the National Christmas Tree has its moment to shine in a lighting ceremony outside the White House. Hopefully, the 40-foot tree won't blow over again like it did earlier this week. With the help of a crane, it's back up, standing upright, hoping the Grinch will stay away tonight. Coming up from us, an eye-opening survey about risky driving. How many people admit to bad behavior on the road and how fast things can go wrong? That's coming up after a break. We're back, and the FBI is today offering a $10,000 reward, listen to this, after the carjacking of an FBI agent just blocks from Capitol Hill. Authorities here in the district say the agent was getting out of his agency-issued vehicle when two suspects approached, and they drove off in the car. The whole thing only lasted a matter of minutes. The vehicle was recovered in another part of the city less than half an hour later. Police say this is the video of the suspects abandoning the video. It's just the latest carjacking in the headlines, and D.C. has seen a huge uptick in vehicles being stolen so far this year, and carjackings are often the reason. NBC's Ryan Riley joins me now. Ryan, you know, you listen to the radio driving into work every day, and it's another carjacking, and I'm going to drive home, and it's another carjacking. I mean, this is a real problem. It really is. You know, it's definitely been pronounced in D.C. You know, more broadly, I think, in the past few years, the reason that we've seen more of these carjackings is really because of technology. It's not like you can just smash a window on a uh, to a car and then hotwire it like you sort of could in the old days. You need that key fob. And that's the reason that, you know, we sort of have this more of a spike in uh, carjackings because it's not as easy to just steal a car that's not occupied. You actually need to physically get that key fob from uh, the driver in that case. So, you know, this could be something that in a few years, maybe there's another more advanced technological solution to, but for now it's a real problem uh, for uh, people in D.C. where we've seen this spike in carjackings. There was actually a member of Congress uh, who had his car uh, jacked uh, last just last month, mm -hmm. so it's definitely been you know hitting average people as well as pretty prominent people, including uh, this uh, per, a member of the FBI. And you've really got to wonder, you know, you see them fleeing after the scene there, if that's after they realized that this was a government vehicle, um, exactly why they, they decided to abandon it here. Um, because, you know, I mean, I imagine if you'd gone going around the glove, you know, the glove box there a little bit, you yeah. might have been able to figure out what was happening here. They may have seen a Kojak light, a police radio, and an FBI badge and realized, oh boy, we made a mistake. Uh, <laughs> Ryan, thank you very much. Ryan Riley. Uh, there's new data out today showing more than half of drivers out there say they are not always practicing safe driving. Now, the studies from the AAA, it found deadly crashes involving risky behaviors like drunk driving or speeding are at an epidemic right now on our roadways. Here's what my team and I found out. For drivers out here, things can go catastrophically wrong in a matter of seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New figures suggest we have a long road to travel when it comes to making the streets even safer. With more than half of all drivers in a new AAA survey admitting they engage in bad behavior behind the wheel. It's unfortunate because I, th I think that we do things behind the wheel of our car that we wouldn't do in line at a grocery store. And lives are at stake when we're on the road. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says more than 19,000 people have been killed on the nation's roads just in the first half of this year. An alarming rate despite improvements over the last year and a half. And the most recent data shows speed contributes to about a third of traffic fatalities. Speed is the biggest factor that we see that leads to crashes. When you throw in a lot of folks behind the wheel distracted, whether it's with other passengers in the car or a cell phone, that's really a combination that's going to lead to 
some bad things and some careless things happening. Pennsylvania State Police say troopers issued more than 10,000 speeding citations over the recent Thanksgiving travel period. That's up 14% from the year before. While in Maryland... Mr. Ken, I got hit. I need fire rescue. A Montgomery County police officer had to have both legs amputated after authorities say a teenager allegedly doing donuts and driving twice the speed limit intentionally hit the officer when he tried to stop him. AAA says while speeding is the most common behavior drivers admit to, about a third also say they've driven distracted or aggressively. These are behaviors that most people wouldn't admit to a friend or a neighbor, but we're willing to admit in this anonymous survey which means that they're almost certainly underestimates of really risky, dangerous, potentially life-altering behaviors. That's Jake Nelson there from AAA who tells me that texting can be one of the biggest distractions for drivers, especially on a highway. When you look away to send or read a message just those five seconds, you're essentially traveling the distance of a football field blind. And just one instant of a second could really lead to some terrible, terrible consequences. So, sorry to sound like your mother, but keep your hands on the wheel and keep your eyes on the road. Still to come, a radio news reporter known as the voice of D.C. talks to one of our doctors about a treatment that changed and might have saved his life. That's coming up next. We're back, and I want you to meet somebody here. For years, D.C. has listened to Neil Augenstein, a, a news radio reporter I hear every day driving to work. He is dubbed the voice of D.C. But when he received a life-changing diagnosis, D.C. was at risk of losing its voice. Here's Dr. Natalie Azar. It'll be crowded here on the highway. You may never have seen him, but if you've ever lived in the D.C. metro area, you've certainly heard him. On I-66, Neil Augenstein, WTOP News. WTOP reporter Neil Augenstein has famously been named the voice of D.C., telling thousands of stories through his career as a radio reporter. But in autumn of 2022, a nagging cough almost changed everything. The cough that I had last fall was a dry cough. It was <coughs> didn't hurt, wasn't terribly deep, but it was a, it was a nuisance. He thought it was allergies, but even though he's never smoked a cigarette, his father did have a history of lung cancer. Out of caution, he went to the hospital to get a chest X-ray. I was tired of coughing. I wanted to get to the bottom of, of what was happening with me. And brought his audience along on his journey. They could see in the very first chest X-ray a small mass in, uh, in my left lung. The scans led Neil to get a bronchoscopy by pulmonologist Dr. Bobby Mahajan at Inova Health Center. How soon did you know the diagnosis was confirmed? So we were able to confirm the diagnosis during the procedure. The CDC says up to 20% of patients diagnosed with lung cancer are non-smokers. And Neil had stage four lung cancer. I had gone back and forth in my mind, uh, you know, a thousand times. A, it's nothing. B, it's lung cancer and it's spread everywhere in my body and I'm doomed. But doomed he was not. An epidermal growth factor receptor or EGFR mutation to his cancer, leading to a different type of treatment and hope. Can you tell us a little bit about this targeted therapy? It's called yeah. TKI. Yeah. So it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and it really is focused on the actual cancer cells only. Cancer treatments like chemotherapy attack the whole body to kill cancer cells, but TKI only attacks cancer cells, keeping the rest of the body fairly healthy. The side effects that I've had from my targeted therapy have been really quite gentle. At first, it was supposed to be lifelong therapy. The goal was to make it just like a chronic disease. But Neil caught another break. It's knocked out my lungs, cancerous lymph nodes and secondary lesions. He could now have surgery to remove all the cancer. Yeah. Neil is cancer free. Sounds like we're going to have the voice of D.C. for a lot longer. That's my my hope. I, I love my job. I look forward to it every day. I'm so lucky to tell these stories and have the trust of so many people. 
Uh, he does have that. All of us in D.C., we know his voice. We listen to him every day, driving to work, coming home. Uh, are there any downsides, Dr. Natalie, to this treatment, and how available is it to anybody that might have lung cancer? Yeah, so it's generally well tolerated, Tom. Um, you know, yes, you can have definitely have some side effects, some things that are, are common that we even sometimes associate with chemotherapy, like some mouth sores and decreased appetite and things like that. There are potentially some more serious side effects that can involve, you know, the heart and and, and things like that, but but not in the majority of people. With regard to who is a candidate for this, this is standard of care for individuals who have lung cancer with this mutation. You know, as we pointed out in the piece, this is not chemotherapy. This is targeted therapy, which is what really anyone diagnosed with cancer these days would be hopeful that they would have a tumor that would be susceptible to a targeted sort of immunotherapy like this, Tom. It really has improved survival for these individuals so tremendously. It's just, and I got five Five seconds. Could it be used for other cancers? Right. So it's not specific to lung cancer. It's specific okay, to good. the mutation. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you very much. Yeah. Great story. That is a wrap for this hour. The news continues right now. Top of the hour, wherever you are, we are coming on the air tonight with negotiations in a race right now. Negotiators are really trying to keep this truce from unraveling at the end of a very fragile ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. How things are looking tonight as we see more hostages released just in the past hour. We are live in the region. Then Congressman George Santos says he will not stand by as he watches his colleagues, in his words, rush a process to kick him out of office, how that vote might be going tomorrow, how that's shaping up. Plus a big day, I mean a big day on Wall Street, camping a very good month for the stock market as we get new numbers on falling mortgage rates and inflation, what the Fed is now looking at as we look into the possibility of no recession ahead. And Facebook's parent company, Meta, taking down thousands of fake accounts created to sway U.S. public opinion. We'll tell you where they came from. Plus, pneumonia is hitting more than 100 kids in an Ohio county, the first cluster of it here in the United States, and why some health experts are putting the blame on COVID lockdowns, what you need to know for your kid. One good day. I'm Tom Costello, and I'm for in for Hallie, who is on assignment. And right now, the incredibly fragile ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas to really pause fighting inside Gaza and let more hostages out, it looks like it may be ending as we're waiting to see more newly freed hostages arrive in Israel. We're going to have more on that in just a moment. But just 24 hours ago, that uneasy deal was extended at the last minute for just a single day. So fast forward to now, where it's just after midnight in the region and negotiators are racing against time to keep the truce going. With lots of questions on whether that could actually happen tonight, local time. As we're just now learning that six Israelis were released in the last hour, so they're now back in Israel. And look at this, another two freed from Hamas captivity earlier. You can see them getting into Red Cross vans right there in Gaza in this exclusive video from Al Jazeera. And here, one of them, 21-year-old Mia Shem, in an emotional reunion with her mother and brother in Israel. Two more hostages are expected to be freed any moment. 30 Palestinians were also released today, according to Egypt. As we're learning of new violence in the region, Israel says at least three people were killed 13 others wounded in a shooting at a bus stop at Jerusalem, Hamas, claiming responsibility for that attack. So we've got team coverage on this story. David Noriega is in Tel Aviv, and Ali Rafa is posted up near the White House tonight. David, it's now 1 a.m. in the region. What could come next in these critical hours of negotiations to try to extend out this deal? Tom, I can tell you that last night it happened well after midnight that this ceasefire was extended by one day. So if last night is any indication, there is still time. However, as you've pointed out, this is fragile. It's extremely minute by minute. It's been fragile and fluid this entire time, and it's not going to stop being fragile and fluid. There's a diplomatic full court press on the part of the United States. Secretary of State Tony Blinken is here in Israel. The director of the CIA has been in Doha. Uh, the FBI 
FBI and, and White House officials have been meeting with family members of Americans still being held hostage in Gaza. Obviously, we have the involvement of the Qataris and the Egyptians. All of those parties are trying as hard as they can to get this extended. What we've heard is that they're looking for a 48-hour, a two-day extension. But the fact that they're looking for that doesn't mean that they're going to get it. Nothing here is guaranteed. Tom? But at the same time, Hamas is claiming responsibility for this attack in Jerusalem today, in which three people were killed, right? What do we know about that? Right. So we know, according to Israeli authorities, that there were two assailants. They opened fire into a crowd of people waiting at a crowded bus stop at rush hour this morning. They killed three people, as you pointed out, injured several more. The assailants themselves were shot and killed by IDF reservists. Uh, it is remarkable that this happened, Tom, and the ceasefire held. It shows, I think, the extent to which the parties involved in the ceasefire, at least this phase of it, which involves exchanging women and children hostages for women and children uh, prisoners, are committed to keeping it in place until at least that group of hostages is out. However, uh, the fact that this attack happened on this day is really cranking up the pressure on the Israeli government from certain sectors of Israeli society to not make a new deal for a new ceasefire or even to not extend the one that we're currently in, right? Because you have to keep in mind that once the women and children have been released from the Gaza Strip, there's going to have to be a new set of negotiations for a new framework of exchange for male hostages and particularly for hostages who are soldiers, that's going to be a politically extremely complicated moment. Tom? David Noriega in Tel Aviv, thank you. Let's bring in now Ali Rafa, who's posted for us up near the White House. Ali, Secretary of State Blinken is meeting with both uh, top Israeli and Palestinian leaders today. Talk about the American diplomatic strategy here to keep this true steel going. Yeah, Tom, this is diplomacy really at its highest levels. We've seen uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken make his third trip to the Middle East, his fourth to Israel since this war began uh, today. And he's adding pressure to these talks, to these urges to extend this ceasefire. White House officials saying that those talks are happening literally by the hour, by the minute. Uh, and Blinken today met with Prime Minister Netanyahu. He met with his war cabinet, as well as Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, and he talked about the expectations that uh, the United States has of Israel once it does resume its military operations in Gaza, once the ceasefire does eventually end. And that's something that Netanyahu assured Blinken would happen, that those military op operations uh, would resume. Blinken first off told Israeli officials uh, that before they do that, the U.S. wants to see assurances uh, that the Israelis will be protecting, will take, will be protecting uh, as innocent civilian life in Gaza uh, more so than we've seen in the past few weeks. They say that once these operations do resume, the loss of life uh, that we saw happen in Gaza, in uh, the north of Gaza when this military operation began, Blinken saying that that cannot happen again in southern Gaza, that they want some sort of assurance that southern Gaza will be deemed uh, a safe space for Palestinians to seek refuge in. Uh, Blinken also also stressing to Netanyahu that with the winter months coming in Gaza, that uh, they want assurances from the Israelis that humanitarian aid will be will be allowed to continue flowing into Gaza. Uh, and he stressed to both Netanyahu and Abbas that the United States is still seeking peace and stability in this region, still very much on track uh, to wanting a two-state solution. Uh, tonight, an Israeli official, when asked about uh, these asks by the U.S., uh, said, quote, Israel and the administration are in close dialogue on many fronts and issues, including the need to apply pressure on Hamas after the pause and give humanitarian aid to the civilian population in Gaza. In these discussions, Israel is really attentive to the U.S. perspective, Tom. Ali, what more do we know about uh, two American hostages who have been freed and another eight believed to still be in captivity and their family members, I understand, are now expressing frustration with the Red Cross, right? That's right. The families of these American hostages that are still being held in Gaza, they met with uh, Red Cross representatives as well as the media yesterday, and they expressed this deep frustration with the Red Cross, who uh, we have seen after all of these hostage releases be really uh, the vehicle for these hostages. Once they're handed over from Hamas, they go to the Red Cross. Then the Red Cross is the uh, organization that allows them to cross through the Rafah border crossing into Egypt, then to Israel 
Israel to receive uh, medical attention. And these families uh, called for the Red Cross to have more public updates as to the condition of their loved ones, their treatment uh, for these Red Cross representatives to be able to uh, access these hostages, to give them medical care if they need it. Uh, and this issue was raised during uh, Blinken's presser in Tel Aviv earlier today. Listen to what he had to say. Clearly, it would be very beneficial and important for the Red Cross to have access uh, to hostages, to be able to uh, uh, check on their well-being uh, and, uh, and condition. Uh, having said that, of course, none of that should be necessary because there shouldn't be any hostages in the first place. These families called on more international organizations to add to this pressure to be able to allow the Red Cross to access these hostages and give them uh, the proper medical attention and care. The families of these hostages were slated to speak uh, and meet with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan today. We've, re we've reached out to the White House for an update on that and have not heard back, Tom. Okay, Ali, thank you very much, Ali Rafa. Uh, just in the last hour, we heard from the first of the Republican House leadership, Republican Steve Scalise, saying he will vote against kicking the controversial Congressman George Santos out of office in tomorrow's vote. That's after Santos got rather heated on the House floor earlier, saying that he will not stand by quietly. On what basis does this body feel that precedent must be changed for me? I'm curious to know. What is the schedule of the Ethics Committee? Why rush this to deliver a predetermined outcome sought out by some members? Well, remember, this is the guy who the House Ethics Committee found spent several thousands of dollars worth of campaign money on high-end shopping items, on Botox and adult website OnlyFans. He's also facing a 23-count federal indictment that accuses him of stealing the identities of campaign donors. Santos has pleaded not guilty to those charges and says he has not done anything wrong. NBC's Ali Vitale is on Capitol Hill. And Ali, we now have Scalise telling us... Uh, he is not going to vote to kick out Scalise, and there needs to be a two-thirds majority, right? What is the likelihood that this does, in fact, go in Santos' favor, that he's not kicked out now? What, what do you, what, how are the winds blowing up there on Capitol Hill? Certainly winds are swirling. We don't know in which direction yet, Tom, because you're right that it will take two-thirds a majority to expel Santos from the House. It would put him in pretty rarefied air, frankly, because this is a very rarely used move, especially at the point that he's at in his legal proceedings. And when you hear Santos talking about changing the rules or setting a new precedent for him, what he's saying is actually true. This is a body that usually waits for the courts to render their verdicts before they kick out members of their body. Typically, those members will leave on their own accord, too. But in this case, Santos is holding firm, and he's here to defend himself. Fiery on the floor today, fiery earlier this morning when he gaggled with reporters outside the Capitol. And that's not stopping his detractors from saying, hey, wait a minute, the ethics report alone was damning, let alone those other 23 federal counts of indictment that Santos still has to defend himself against. This is what his detractors are saying on the floor, even as Santos remains stoic in his own defense. Watch. If we do not take the ethics committee and their results seriously, then why even have the committee in the first place. These are the exhibits that they attach to the investigative report. The 50 plus page report goes into great detail and it paints a picture of the fraud committed by Santos. And that last man there, Congressman Guest, is not only a Republican lawmaker who's speaking out against Santos, Tom, he is the head of the Ethics Committee. I cannot stress for you enough how rare it is for us to see members of the Ethics Committee weighing in after Ethics Committee reports are out there. But in this instance, we're not just seeing it from the Republican top member on the Ethics Committee, but from his counterpart, the Democrat, Congressman Susan Wild, also speaking today on the floor, saying that the report is damning enough to expel Santos from Congress. You know, to the point about a precedent, of course, we've got New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez under federal indictment, and he's not yeah. at the moment being kicked out. Uh, and there are so many layers to this, right, because the Republicans have such a very razor-thin majority in the House that losing Santos could really put them in an even more delicate position. 
There are so many layers to this, and it's frankly one of those stories that Congress nerds like me absolutely love, because <laughs> when you talk about setting precedents here, this could be a moment where we look down the road a few years ahead from now and say that once they start saying that they can expel lawmakers who simply have allegations and have not yet been found guilty of the things that they're alleged to have done, that this is now a sticky situation. The politics of it have always been true and are very tangible here for Congressman Santos. The fact that Republicans only have a razor-thin majority, four or five seats, has always been difficult for them. It's why we watched then Speaker McCarthy slow walk the Santos, should he be expelled or not expelled moment. And now we're seeing it finally come to a head because of the Ethics Committee. It sort of explains why the number two Republican, Steve Scalise, is saying that he's voting against it. This could be a move of political preservation. He's in leadership. They've already got a tough time counting votes. But it also could be a moment where he doesn't want to set that precedent. When you bring up Senator Menendez, though, that's something that Congressman Matt Gates also brought up while he was on the floor defending Santos from expulsion. So this precedent will have ripple effects far beyond George Santos and far beyond the House of Representatives. Yeah. You love it, and you're good at it. Ali, thank you very much. <laughs> Ali Vitale, yeah, you got to be in it. Uh, tonight, millions of people are under a threat of severe weather in Texas as the South gets totally slammed. Southeast Texas and Louisiana are getting the brunt of the storm's wrath with big hail seen in the Houston area, along with some super strong winds and heavy rain. Six inches could fall by tomorrow. The Gulf Coast facing the biggest threats of tornadoes. And in Hawaii, floodwaters are hitting the islands hard, especially the Big Island, during a major rain, of rain event there with overflowing cesspools and sewers and manholes, leaving folks exposed to dead animals and chemicals and, and sewage water. The state has issued a public brown water advisory telling people to stay off the streets. It all comes as the UN World Meteorologist Organization says, no surprise, 2023 is set to become the warmest year ever, and we're definitely headed in the wrong direction. Let's bring in meteorologist Bill Karens. Bill, yesterday it was snow in the Great Lakes. Today it's tornadoes and some ugly weather down south, right? It's been a bad weather week. Yeah, and things are going to get worse uh, over the weekend, especially in the Pacific Northwest. And hopefully we'll get through tonight without too many tornadoes, or hopefully no tornadoes if we're lucky. So far, we haven't had any. We have numerous areas of heavy rain in Arkansas, heavy rain between Houston and Lake Charles. I've been watching this one thunderstorm. See the magenta color in here? This is heading out of Galveston. This is probably head towards Port Arthur. So we'll have to watch this one to see if it starts spin up, if it spins up any tornadoes. But Houston, you look like you're finally in the clear. This whole storm system will weaken tomorrow, but heavy rain early in the morning, kind of ugly. Chicago to Indian Annapolis, Cleveland, Detroit, Toledo, and then late in the day, Friday evening travel, New York City, Philadelphia, some rain, and then Saturday, we're going to watch heavy rain developing once again in the Florida panhandle, and then during the afternoon, heading down for central Florida. And as far as that Kona low goes, that's what they call these storms. They're common in the wintertime. It means southerly flow over the islands, and we can get some epic rain events, and we've been having one since midnight Hawaii time. They've had 12 to 18 inches of rain just southeast of Hilo here, this area right where our hand is. So you get that much rain, all the runoff over the agri agricultural land. That's why they're telling everyone stay out of all the water, whether it's on land or out over the ocean. Tom, they want people to avoid it because of all those things you mentioned that are now in it. Yeah, it sounds really gross. Listen, I, I was reading in the paper just before we came on uh, the air that we may see northern lights that could be visible tonight. This has a chance to be special, but you have to be far north, as always. You know, this is one of those nights I wish I could just jump in the car and drive as far north as I can. So here's the forecast for the northern lights. This is what we call a G3 uh, geomagnetic storm. They go from zero to five being the highest. This was a borderline three to four. And so this bottom green line is how far south potentially it would be visible. The further North you go, definitely visible. So northern Maine, northern Michigan. I think tomorrow morning on social media and probably here on the Today Show, we'll have some incredible pictures here from Canada and the northern part. But, of course, you need clear skies. So here's that cloud forecast after midnight. Not bad in central New England, but the best areas, northern Michigan, Wisconsin, Minneapolis, northwards to Duluth. This area and even North Dakota looks to have pretty much clear skies. But, Tom, I don't know if you noticed the last couple of nights. We've been just past a full moon. It is very bright, about 84%. Yeah. So that could dull it a little bit, but it still yeah. could be a pretty fantastic show. Uh, you know, I, I have to yet to do it. It's on my bucket list, but uh, not this time for me.
I can't get to Canada that fast tonight. I that 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 uh, full moon has been amazing. I took a yes. photo of it at 6 a.m. It was like it, it was just unbelievably right. bright. I yep. uh, hey, listen, before we let you go, Bill, we have to talk about the national tree because moments ago we saw the president and first lady light the tree, but of course we saw it take a bit of a, a tumble because of the strong winds earlier this week. And I know you've called for an investigation for Tree Gate. Why I wasn't somebody heard a watching thing? it? <laughs> it's just been buried. I mean, look, here's the facts. A 40 mile per hour wind blew it down. The tree is up for like four weeks, five weeks, every single year. We get 45, 40 mile per hour gusts every single year, and it never took the tree down. This time yeah. it did. So the reason is why. But no one is asking those hard hitting questions in D.C. anymore. You guys are all pushovers. <laughs> you know how much uh, blow, how many blowhards are in the city? We're used to a lot of wind in the city. All right, I mean, right, you guys Bill. have potholes that last weeks you get names to your potholes this tree was put back up in 30 minutes what's going on yeah. <laughs> bill thank you very much right. bill karens all right well guess what a big day on wall street today with the dow jumping 500 points count them sending the index to a new high for the year and camping a very strong november rally up eight percent on the month and that's on the back of a key inflation marker from the fed and some strong tech earnings all of that driving this big market rally investors are now betting big that the fed will cut interest rates several times sometimes starting next year and this comes as we've also got new numbers out today that show mortgage rates are dropping to the lowest level since september down to 7.22 percent yes we know rates dropped over the past few months the average rate on a 30-year loan still a lot higher than it was two years ago, three years ago, or whatever, when rates were around 3%. And we also learned today that pending home sales, which measure signed contracts on existing homes, they fell to the lowest level since they started back in 2001. So we bring in right now Caleb Silver, the editor-in-chief of Investopedia. Caleb, we got a key piece of inflation data today about how inflation is already playing out, maybe starting to cool, and that really is what the market liked, right? So is Jerome Powell, the Fed chairman, is his plan working to, buy, to cool the economy by hiking interest rates, and might we avoid a recession? Yeah, so far, so good. And the Fed did pause interest rate hikes the last time, the last two times it met, and will probably pause again when it meets again in the middle of December because inflation has stopped accelerating. In fact, it was flat month over month. You talk about a 3.5% annual rate of inflation. Tom, you remember when it was 9% in July of 2022. So it has come down slowly but surely. And the fact that gas prices are down meaningfully as well means more people have more money to spend. So all of that is also releasing the pressure on the 10-year yield uh, for the Treasury bonds, which really drive the stock market. That's why the stock yeah. market's been rallying in November. Yields on the 10-year have fallen. Stocks have been rising. Yeah, and let's keep in mind that the rate of inflation, I mean, inflation itself is still going up. It's just the rate of that, of that increase is slowing. Let's talk right now about housing, though. People are used to these really low, low, low rates, right? I mean, 4%, 3%, but that's not realistic historically. I mean, the first house I bought, I think I paid 10% on, and now we're at what, seven and a quarter percent? How much lower do you think these rates could go? Will we ever get back down to what we saw a couple of years ago? Yeah, I talked to our parents' generation, and they were paying 12%, 13%. So we've had it good yeah. for a very long time. Half of homeowners have mortgage rates that are under 5%. So people are not incentivized to sell right now. And for first-time homebuyers, very hard to buy when mortgage rates are this high. And home prices are so high, too, because of tight supply. Mortgage rates are going to continue to tick lower. Why? Because of what you said at the top. The Fed will probably start cutting rates next year. And the 30-year mortgage is very sensitive to the Fed funds rate. So as the Fed cuts rates or intuits that it will cut rates over time, you're going to see mortgage rates drop very quickly. They're not going to go back down to 5% or 4%. They're going to be in this 6 to 7% range, and I think that's going to get more people into the housing market. Well, that's real money. And then, of course, if you buy, if you buy high and the, and the rate is high, you can always, uh, you know, refi down, as I just talked to somebody outside the uh, studio here about a, a minute ago. Caleb, thank you. All right, well, let's stay with the pocketbook issues, because some of the countries that pump a lot of the world's oil, many of them, OPEC members, are deciding to cut 
production, to cut oil production, at a time when it seems there's an awful lot of supply out there. Why now? Well, global economic growth is slowing, in part because of the wars in the Middle East and Ukraine. China is slowing. And the U.S. is pumping record amounts of oil. Surprise! Did you know this? The U.S. is now the world's biggest oil producer. And oil is priced globally, not locally. Oil-producing countries are struggling to keep prices up. Look at West Texas crude right now. 75 bucks a barrel, down from $123 a barrel 18 months ago. And that's even after they announced that they're going to be cutting supply. So uh, CNBC's Brian Sullivan joins me. Brian, these lower oil prices are good news at the pump. Drivers are paying about, what, 25, 30 cents less than a year ago. OPEC is trying to get their prices up, but these price cuts, they're voluntary. Um, and I was shocked. They cut, they, they cut production today, and yet, guess what? The price of oil went down. Does that mean the world doesn't really believe that these, that these cuts are real? That's it. That's exactly it, Tom. You know, listen, uh, th these are voluntary cuts. These countries, these members of OPEC, they have decided that they will voluntarily cut certain amounts of oil led by Iran, cutting another one million barrels a day. What you got to remember is OPEC back in June announced cuts then. So you got those cuts totaling perhaps as much as three and a half to four million barrels a day. And then these cuts layered on them. So why isn't oil higher? Well, you nailed it. Number one, we just don't know if all these cuts are actually happening, wink, wink. But also, you've got a lot of U.S. supply, right? We've got U.S. gasoline demand. It is down. Chinese demand, not as strong. Europe, they've been kind of in this semi-rolling recession because their energy cost was higher. So their energy usage is coming down. And again, it's economics 101. When you've got more or too much of something, and then you've got demand coming down as well in certain parts of the world, that is an oversupply situation. But I don't want to make too much of it. 75 bucks a barrel, yes, to your point, is not 123 at the peak when Russia invaded Ukraine, but it's also not 50 bucks a barrel. Although if we, if we continue to see U.S. supply, Canadian supply, and Brazilian supply go up, Tom, we could in fact see oil go down even with some of these cuts, particularly if they don't actually occur. Yeah, I heard you say wink, wink. In other words, just because they say it doesn't mean it's true. Hey, listen, Correct. let me ask you about the environmental impact here, because that's been a big focus of the COP28 climate summit. There, there's conflicting views, or there are conflicting views about the future of fossil fuels. Some think the oil and gas industry is the future. Others think... Nope, not so much. It's going to be a dinosaur. It's dying. What kind of pressure are we now seeing on these big oil producers, even with prices going down? Yeah, kind of odd to have the OPEC meeting on the same day as the kickoff of the major climate summit in the UAE. Yeah. But that, that's probably a different story for a different guest. Huge amounts of pressure here, Tom. I mean, we talk about carbon capture, which is basically, OK, you've got carbon being spewed into the atmosphere. That's the bad stuff. We want to remove that. So you've got companies that are trying to invest in mach literally giant machines that almost sort of, for lack of a better term, try to vacuum some of this carbon out. Right. We're trying to raise our, our gasoline standards. We're trying to shift more to EVs, although I will say with electric cars, they're heavy. They go through tires faster. They, they hurt asphalt faster. And guess what? Asphalt and tires are both made up of, you guessed it, oil. Gasoline is about half of a barrel of oil. And I will say this, ExxonMobil just investing big time in lithium, which is the quote unquote gasoline for electric car batteries. God, you, you cover a fascinating beat, and there's just so many elements to it, often conflicting. Brian, thank you very much. Brian Sullivan at CNBC. Uh, in Los Angeles tonight, a woman is facing murder charges for allegedly shooting and killing an influential Hollywood social activist. The DA's office says the woman targeted activist Michael Latt for being friends with the woman that she, the suspect, was stalking. On Monday, she allegedly forced herself into Latt's house and shot him. He died at a nearby hospital. Lat is the founder of a social impact marketing agency called Lead with Love, which works to support influential women and artists of color, according to the website. Several notable people have commented on Instagram postings about his death, like film producer Scott Budnick, who said Lat brought hope and love to everyone. And Grey's Anatomy star Jesse Williams called him a shining beacon. Coming up from us, new details around the Pope's health, what he says he's now been diagnosed with. Plus, why an arrest warrant is out today for a star NFL player from many teams. You'll know the name. Stay with us.
Bottom of the hour, we're back. And a new report from Facebook parent company Meta says it has taken down nearly 5,000 fake accounts from China as that country becomes one of the most aggressive actors trying to sway U.S. public opinion on social media. The accounts on Facebook were aimed at Americans, criticizing both sides of the political spectrum. And that means the intention here is not necessarily to push to one side or the other, but really just to capitalize on and further divide the country. The information comes from Meta's third quarter integrity report. It says the company took down five distinct Chinese networks targeting foreign audiences just this year, which is more than any other country. And that brings up real concerns as we head into the 2024 election. Let's bring in NBC News cybersecurity reporter Kevin Collier. Kevin, this seems like a lot of accounts, but it also tells us probably there are more out there, right? It sounds like China is not backing off its attempt to influence U.S. public opinion. That's right. It's, it's as if they have doubled down on all these efforts. Uh, but a lot of them are relatively low effort. Like, for example, a lot of these political accounts where they're trying to engage with U.S. politics are simply retweeting or, or copying and pasting what American politicians have said. That's, that's their engagement with the American political system. And we should know, by the way, uh, that, that China has resolutely, resolutely denied uh, having any sort of involvement with any of these campaigns, similar to how they often deny any sort of hacking operation that's widely attributed to them. And they, they said there's a rumor campaign that Meta has conducted here. Hmm. Do these foreign efforts to influence U.S. opinion, do they, do they work? Do they pay off? And also, why is it so hard to bring down these accounts? You know, there, there are three big ones here. We've got um, Iran basically, basically is the most aggressive of the three. Uh, Russia is, is wrote the playbook, and China is the most prolific with, with, with uh, these influence campaigns. Why is it so hard for them to take down? One reason is, uh, you know, we broke the news recently that the FBI, the entire U.S. intelligence community, no longer briefs tech companies on foreign intelligence or foreign information campaigns, influence campaigns. Uh, there's a Republican uh, attorney general lawsuit that basically froze the FBI. They've not received or they've not given any of these briefings to Facebook, to Google, to, to, to X in several months now. And this report also highlights the challenges for AI, right? These platforms uh, are increasingly relying on AR, that I becomes that becomes more prominent. Does that complicate this whole issue, make it more difficult to spot these 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 fake attacks? It does. And with so many AI threats, it's not that AI totally changes everything, revolutionizes everything, is that it streamlines and exacerbates the problem. So if, if for instance you've got someone working in a troll factory and they're they're creating an account, they've got a fake profile picture they have to find, they have to write content. Well, AI can streamline that. AI can create profile pictures. AI can, you know, ChatGPT or some other large language model can write content for you, and that can make it easier to scale influence operations. Excuse me, Kevin, uh, thank you very much. Good information there. Let's get you over now to the five things our th team thinks you might want to know about tonight. Number one, a New York appeals court has now reinstated that gag order against former President Donald Trump. It was put on hold for a couple of weeks while Trump tried to appeal it. The order bans Trump, who's repeatedly targeted the New York judge's law clerk for making public statements about the judge's staff. Number two, Dallas police issued an arrest warrant for Buffalo Bills linebacker Von Miller for allegedly assaulting a pregnant woman. We don't know their connection to each other yet. The victim was treated for minor injuries. Miller, his attorney, and his agents did not immediately return messages from NBC News seeking comment. A rep for the bill says the team is in the process of gathering more information. Number three, the front man for the punk band, the Pogues, Shane McGowan, has died at the age of 65. He's best known for co-writing the Christmas song, Fairy Tale in New York. We don't know an official cause of death yet, but he was diagnosed with viral encephalitis last year. His family says he died peacefully with them by his side. Number four, the Biden administration has a new plan that would have most U.S. cities replace their lead water pipes within a decade. Millions of people still drink water from lead pipes, and the EPA says tighter standards would improve IQ scores in kids and cut down high pressure and heart disease uh, in adults, high blood pressure. Number five, Golden Globe nominee Sebastian Stan is set to play a young Donald Trump in an upcoming movie. It's called The Apprentice, and it will dive into Trump's efforts to build a real estate empire. And Iranian filmmaker Ali Abazi will be directing. 
Now we want to bring you today's original. It's a segment we work on, in-depth reporting on a topic we keep an eye on. And tonight, that's the risk of carbon monoxide poisoning. The invisible gas is odorless. It can kill. And detectors can be the only warning. A new NBC News investigation has found at least 19 people have died from suspected carbon monoxide poisoning at Airbnbs in the last decade. And now the families of those tragedies are speaking out and fighting back, pushing for the company to require carbon monoxide alarms in every one of their listings. NBC's Hallie Jackson has that story. When Sebastian Mejia won a prestigious Fulbright scholarship and moved to Brazil last year, his mom, Rosa, couldn't have felt more proud. He was the kind of person that really did everything that he wanted to do. He said his goals and worked towards it. But just a few months later, Sebastian's family got a message from the host of the Airbnb where he'd been staying. The 24-year-old was dead. All I can describe is like a bomb dropped on me. I felt every single possible feeling. I was in shock. I literally, when I learned what happened with Sebastian, I stopped breathing. My heart died with him. The killer, carbon monoxide poisoning. Initially, it's just where, I mean, shock, grief, sadness, crying. Now it's more, it turns to like anger. Carbon monoxide gas has no smell, no color, no taste, sometimes called the invisible killer. It's made when fuel is burned in things like water heaters, gas stoves, and cars. Its symptoms mimic the flu, and in high concentrations, it can be deadly, which is why detectors are critical. According to a technical report from Rio de Janeiro police, Sebastian's Airbnb had four times the maximum acceptable carbon monoxide levels and no detector in the bathroom where Sebastian died, the report says, a broken water heater and improper ventilation. My son didn't have to die. An investigation by NBC News has identified 19 deaths since 2013 at Airbnb properties involving alleged carbon monoxide poisoning. All of those deaths happened outside the U.S. While nearly every American state requires detectors in some residential buildings, international guidelines recommend a detector on every floor, but regulations differ by country. After a death in Taiwan in 2014, Airbnb said in a blog post it would require hosts to install carbon monoxide detectors by the end of the year. Nearly a decade later, still no requirement. That blog post now deleted. When people rent those spaces, they expect, again, a minimum level of safety and protection. And without a carbon monoxide alarm, we can't be sure that we're going to wake up the next day. Airbnb says safety is a top priority, describing incidents as exceptionally rare. For hosts, the company encourages the installation of detectors and offers a free one. So far, giving out detectors to nearly a quarter million hosts. That amounts to fewer than 6% of all hosts worldwide. One 2018 study found less than 60% of U.S.-based Airbnb hosts said they had carbon monoxide detectors installed. For renters, Airbnb provides a search filter to find only homes with detectors. At least six lawsuits have been filed against the company concerning carbon monoxide poisoning, including one by Sebastian's family. Three are ongoing, one was dismissed, and two were settled for undisclosed amounts. Now, Sebastian's family says they're pushing for Airbnb to require all properties have carbon monoxide detectors. We don't care about any settlement that Airbnb is trying to reach with us. We want people to know about this issue so that it's changed. That amount of money will ever compensate the life and the future than my son had. Never. Rosa, working to honor her son's legacy by fighting for change. Hallie Jackson, NBC News. When we come back, uh, a U.S. state is now reporting a big uptick in the number of kids with pneumonia. We're talking to a doctor about who's at risk. Plus, a major crackdown in Russia, what the country's new Supreme Court ruling means for LGBTQ activists there. We're back, and a county in Ohio is the first in the country to report a cluster of pneumonia cases in kids. The medical director for Warren County tells NBC News there have been 145 cases reported since August, and that meets the state's definition of an outbreak. It comes as hospitals in China and Denmark have been reporting surging cases of pediatric pneumonia there. The county's medical director says there's no connection to the outbreaks in China or Denmark. 
Dr. Kavita Patel is one of our favorites. She's here to help us understand all of this. A lot of experts think that the COVID lockdown, what, could have suppressed immunity for kids of, the, of what they're exposed to naturally, and therefore they're more susceptible to pneumonia? Yeah, that's, that's the running theory. But in general, this is similar to what we did see in the United States. What we're seeing in China happened about a year ago in the United States with the triple demic. So the idea is that China has had this immunity debt or people mm -hmm. that have not been exposed. And they've and been locked down more recently. More recently. Recently, their lockdowns were kind of released more recently. But then in, in terms of what's unfolding, and it won't just be Ohio, I, I'm mm. sure that we will see this pattern cropping up. It is, again, kind of these seasonal viruses. And they made it clear in the public health department that they're trying to figure out the sources, mm. but they're not concerned that it's something of a novel COVID virus or something to be concerned about. But it is heightened awareness for parents everywhere, including no matter where you are outside of Ohio, that if you've got sniffles, something, get it checked out. Okay, so uh, the next question is, what should you be watching for? Now, right. as a kid, I had, uh, when I was a teenager, I think, I had walking pneumonia. Yeah. And if my next door neighbor wasn't the family doctor, he said he would have put me in the ER, but instead he came over and checked on me. Right. So what should parents be watching for? How do you know that it's something more serious than just, you know, the sniffles? Yeah, so something that always went in doubt, just get it checked out. But when it's more serious, the clinical signs that make it more serious, fevers, chills, things that might start out as nasal congestion, but seem to get deeper and deeper into not just a cough, off, but children telling you they've got pain, pain mm -hmm. in their chest when they breathe, those are warning signs. And then, of course, if someone's having difficulty breathing, always kind of make that an urgent case. And get it checked out because doctors and pediatricians can test for the four kind of common viruses, flu A, flu B, RSV, and COVID. Those are the kind of magic four that we're seeing a yeah, lot. And some of them are teaming up. I remember yeah. being exhausted. I mean, literally sleeping Fatigue. 20 hours right. a day. Right. And uh, just could not get picked up out of bed. Yeah, that's another great sign. GI distress with RSV, we can see kind of problems with your appetite, problems digesting, so that can be another clue. But anytime you, you know, parents know best. Yeah. When you see somebody and when you see your child in distress, don't wait to get it checked out because remember, we've got treatments for COVID in mm -hmm. some cases. We have an RSV vaccine now. If you don't have RSV, all things to think about. What you said is so critical. We always, we as parents sometimes doubt ourselves. No, right. we know no, our kids best. We do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dr. Yeah. Patel, thank you very much. You. Good info as always. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories each day, and because it's tough to read, to watch, to listen to every single one of them, our international teams have broken down some highlights, and here are some of the things they're keeping an eye on. We call the segment the global. Out of Japan, the country is suspending its Osprey flights, and it's asking the U.S. to suspend its flights, too. The U.S. Air Force uh, there had an Osprey crash off the coast. At least one crew member died, seven others missing, and the investigation still is ongoing. We don't know what caused that crash. In Russia today, its Supreme Court ruled that LGBTQ activists should be considered extremists and basically banned that movement there in Russia, part of a larger push in Russia to crack down on LGBTQ activities. And from Italy, Pope Francis says he's got acute infectious bronchitis and says doctors there have told him to skip his trip to Dubai for the UN climate conference because of quick changes in temperature, even though he's sick. He still had audiences scheduled today, and he told one of them, quote, as you can see, I'm still alive. Yes, he is. Coming up from us, a new study says there's an epidemic on our roadways. What my team and I found out. That's coming up next. We're back, and the FBI is today offering a $10,000 reward, listen to this, after the carjacking of an FBI agent just blocks from Capitol Hill. Authorities here in the district say the agent was getting out of his agency-issued vehicle when two suspects approached, and they drove off in the car. The whole thing only lasted a matter of minutes. The vehicle was recovered in another part of the city less than half an hour later. Police say this is the video of the suspects abandoning the video. It's just the latest carjacking in the headlines, and D.C. has seen a huge uptick in vehicles being stolen so far this year, and carjackings are often the reason. NBC's Ryan Riley joins me now. Ryan, you know, you listen to the radio driving into work every day, and it's another carjacking, and I'm going to drive home and it's another carjacking. I mean, this is a real problem. 
It really is. You know, it's definitely been pronounced in D.C. You know, more broadly, I think in the past few years, the reason that we've seen more of these carjackings is really because of technology. It's not like you can just smash a window on a uh, to a car and then hotwire it like you sort of could in the old days. You need that key fob. And that's the reason that, you know, we sort of have this more of a spike in uh, carjackings because it's not as easy to just steal a car that's not occupied. You actually need to physically get that key fob from uh, the driver in that case. So, you know, this could be something that in a few years, maybe there's another more advanced technological solution to. But for now, it's a real problem uh, for uh, people in D.C. where we've seen this spike in carjackings. There was actually a member of Congress uh, who had his car uh, jacked uh, last just last month. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely been, you know, hitting average people as well as pretty prominent people, including uh, this uh, per, a member of the FBI. And you've really got to wonder, you know, you see them fleeing after the scene there, if that's after they realized that this was a government vehicle, um, exactly why they, they decided to abandon it here. Um, because, you know, I mean, I, I imagine if you had gone going around the glove, you know, the glove box there a little bit, you yeah. might have been able to figure out what was happening here. They may have seen a Kojak light, a police radio, and an FBI badge and realized, oh boy, we made a mistake. Uh, Ryan, thank you very much. Ryan Riley. Uh, there's new data out today showing more than half of drivers out there say they are not always practicing safe driving. Now, the studies from the AAA, it found deadly crashes involving risky behaviors like drunk driving or speeding are at an epidemic right now on our roadways. Here's what my team and I found out. For drivers out here, things can go catastrophically wrong in a matter of seconds. <laughs> New figures suggest we have a long road to travel when it comes to making the streets even safer. With more than half of all drivers in a new AAA survey admitting they engage in bad behavior behind the wheel. It's unfortunate because I, th I think that we do things behind the wheel of our car that we wouldn't do in line at a grocery store. And lives are at stake when we're on the road. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says more than 19,000 people have been killed on the nation's roads just in the first half of this year. An alarming rate despite improvements over the last year and a half. And the most recent data shows speed contributes to about a third of traffic fatalities. Speed is the biggest factor that we see that leads to crashes. When you throw in a lot of folks behind the wheel distracted, whether it's with other passengers in the car or a cell phone, that's really a combination that's going to lead to some bad things and some careless things happening. Pennsylvania State Police say troopers issued more than 10,000 speeding citations over the recent Thanksgiving travel period. That's up 14 percent from the year before. While in Maryland. I got hit. I need to you. A Montgomery County police officer had to have both legs amputated after authorities say a teenager allegedly doing donuts and driving twice the speed limit intentionally hit the officer when he tried to stop him. AAA says while speeding is the most common behavior drivers admit to, about a third also say they've driven distracted or aggressively. These are behaviors that most people wouldn't admit to a friend or a neighbor, but we're willing to admit in this anonymous survey, which means that they're almost certainly underestimates of really risky, dangerous, potentially life-altering behaviors. That's Jake Nelson there from AAA, who tells me that texting can be one of the biggest distractions for drivers, especially on a highway. When you look away to send or read a message just those five seconds, you're essentially traveling the distance of a football field blind. And just one instant of a second could really lead to some terrible, terrible consequences. So, sorry to sound like your mother, but keep your hands on the wheel and keep your eyes on the road. Still to come, a radio news reporter known as the voice of D.C. talks to one of our doctors about a treatment that changed and might have saved his life. That's coming up next. back and I want you to meet somebody here. For years, D.C. has listened to Neil Augenstein, a news radio reporter I hear every day driving to work. He is dubbed the voice of D.C. But when he received a life-changing diagnosis, D.C. was at risk of losing its voice. Here's Dr. Natalie Azar. 
It'll be crowded here on the highway. You may never have seen him, but if you've ever lived in the D.C. metro area, you've certainly heard him. On I-66, Neil Augenstein, WTOP News. WTOP reporter Neil Augenstein has famously been named the voice of D.C., telling thousands of stories through his career as a radio reporter. But in autumn of 2022, a nagging cough almost changed everything. The cough that I had last fall was a dry cough. It was <coughs> didn't hurt, wasn't terribly deep, but it was a, it was a nuisance. He thought it was allergies, but even though he's never smoked a cigarette, his father did have a history of lung cancer. Out of caution, he went to the hospital to get a chest X-ray. I was tired of coughing. I wanted to get to the bottom of, of what was happening with me. And brought his audience along on his journey. They could see in the very first chest X-ray a small mass in uh, in my left lung. The scans led Neil to get a bronchoscopy by pulmonologist Dr. Bobby Mahajan at Inova Health Center. How soon did you know the diagnosis was confirmed? So we were able to confirm the diagnosis during the procedure. The CDC says up to 20% of patients diagnosed with lung cancer are non-smokers. And Neil had stage four lung cancer. I had gone back and forth in my mind, uh, you know, a thousand times. A, it's nothing. B, it's lung cancer and it's spread everywhere in my body and I'm doomed. But doomed he was not. An epidermal growth factor receptor or EGFR mutation to his cancer, leading to a different type of treatment and hope. Can you tell us a little bit about this targeted therapy? It's called yeah. TKI. Yeah. So it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and it really is focused on the actual cancer cells only. Cancer treatments like chemotherapy attack the whole body to kill cancer cells, but TKI only attacks cancer cells, keeping the rest of the body fairly healthy. The side effects that I've had from my targeted therapy have been really quite gentle. At first, it was supposed to be lifelong therapy. The goal was to make it just like a chronic disease. But Neil caught another break. It's knocked out my lungs, cancerous lymph nodes, and secondary lesions. He could now have surgery to remove all the cancer. Yeah. Neil is cancer-free. Sounds like we're going to have the voice of D.C. for a lot longer. That's my, my hope. I, I love my job. I look forward to it every day. I'm so lucky to tell these stories and have the trust of so many people. Uh, he does have that. All of us in D.C., we know his voice. We listen to him every day, driving to work, coming home. Uh, are there any downsides, Dr. Natalie, to this treatment, and how available is it to anybody that might have lung cancer? Yeah, so it's generally well tolerated, Tom. Um, you know, yes, you can have definitely have some side effects, some things that are, are common that we even sometimes associate with chemotherapy, like some mouth sores and decreased appetite and things like that. There are potentially some more serious side effects that can involve, you know, the heart and, and things like that, but but not in the majority of people. With regard to who is a candidate for this, this is standard of care for individuals who have lung cancer with this mutation. You know, as we pointed out in the piece, this is not chemotherapy. This is targeted therapy, which is what really anyone diagnosed with cancer these days would be hopeful that they would have a tumor that would be susceptible to a targeted sort of immunotherapy like this, Tom. It really has improved survival for these individuals so tremendously. It's just, and I got five seconds. Could it be used for other cancers? Right. So it's not specific to lung cancer. It's specific okay, to good. the mutation. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you very much. Yeah. Great story. That is a wrap for this hour. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.